Saturday, August 3rd. In Europe, the British have launched new air attacks on German objectives, and German planes again have ranged over the British Isles. British-Japanese relations are further strained with the arrest by Scotland Yard of two prominent Japanese in London. But now the news from Europe Direct. First, reports from London and Berlin. Afterwards, the latest news from our own national capital. First, for the report from the British capital by Eric Severide. Go ahead, London. This is London. It was confirmed in London this morning, some hours after the first announcement last night from Tokyo, that two prominent Japanese businessmen have been arrested. They were detained by special branch officers from Scotland Yard under national defense regulations. Tokyo claims the arrests were pure retaliation for the jailing of British colony members over there. This was denied today in London. The first man arrested is Makahari, an importer and shipper, who has been here for 10 years. The other is a man named Taradi. Scotland Yard men arrived at Makahari's house in Putney while he was on his way home from his office. The housekeeper allowed them in. They searched all the rooms and examined his papers. When he arrived, he was told to pay, pack a bag and was taken to Scotland Yard. It's just been announced that Lord Halifax will see the Japanese ambassador today. German raiders are over last night as usual. They bombed areas in the north and northeast Scotland, the Midlands, the southeast, and the Bristol Channel. Most damage was done to a town near Bristol, and another town in Wales was hit. The exact number of casualties is not yet known. One church and one school are reported down. There's every indication that the Italian force at Solom, just inside Egypt, will soon attack. This morning, a war office spokesman estimated Italian strength there at about two divisions. The British cabinet is being transformed, at least to a certain extent. For days, there has been talk of this, and late last night it was announced that the inner war cabinet now has a sixth member. He is Lord Beaverbrook, the Canadian-born newspaper tycoon, who since May has been Minister of Aircraft Production, where he's made a good record. He will not remain in the inner circle with Churchill, Chamberlain, Halifax, Apley, and Greenwood as aircraft production minister, however. In this super cabinet, not even the service ministries are included. He may replace Chamberlain. The former premier has not only come under great criticism, but he is a sick man. It's more than likely that Beaverbrook will take charge of British propaganda, with special emphasis on propaganda directed at foreign countries. He held that job at the end of the last war. He has permitted his newspapers in the last few days to join in the terrific attacks on Alfred Duff Cooper, the present Minister of Information whose position as a result has become untenable. After Duff Cooper's verbal battle with the editors, it is impossible for him to remain as information minister. Foreign propaganda is now of intense importance. A battle has begun between the British and the Germans for the control of the minds and sentiments of the French, the Belgian, and the Dutch peoples. Starvation perhaps faces a continent. The British must convince these people that Germany is responsible and the Germans are doing their best to blame it on the British blockade. Beaverbrook and others feel no time must be lost in striking the first heavy propaganda blows. From British correspondents on the Franco-Spanish frontier come reports that the so-called moral regeneration of France has already begun in minor ways. We're informed that sunbathing and two-piece bathing costumes are now banned on French beaches. Dance shows like the Folie Bergère and the Bal Tabaran are now forbidden. It's worth pointing out that exactly this type of rule was enforced as one of the first acts of the Franco people after their victory in Spain. All information reaching London points to a regime in France which will seek to uproot Freemason societies, Jews, and of course all political and social liberal thought. And what part the church will play in this new regime is not yet clear. The Queen of England will be 40 years old tomorrow and she will spend her birthday, the fourth since the king came to the throne, with an informal family party. This time, there will be none of the customary peacetime salutes and displays of flags. This is CBS in London, returning you now to Columbia in New York. That was Eric Severide reporting from London. Here is the Press Association dispatch from Rome. The Italian High Command, in a communique issued today, declared that British airplanes have raided the airport on Italy's island of Sardinia. One death was caused, and there were said to be wounds to three persons and some material damage. It also was admitted that British raids on the Italian base at Bardia, North Africa, had caused some losses among troops. But the Italians announced that they had bombed and machine gunned British troop concentrations near Buna in Kenya, East Africa.
Now, we've heard from Eric Severide reporting from London, and now we take you to the German capital for the report of Edwin Hartridge. Go ahead, Berlin. This is Berlin. In this quiet period, before a widely publicized storm to come, that is, the blitzkrieg against England, there's no real news to be found in the German papers. This morning, most of the Berlin papers devote a large part of their front pages to editorial applause of Monsieur Molotov's speech of Thursday night. It is described as an attack on England and the English Empire. For instance, the Borsten Zeitung carries the big headline this morning, Molotov destroys England's illusion. The general editorial of the Berlin press is that this speech is an indication of the opposition between Russia and Great Britain. The point that he made that Russian-German relations are based on a strict division of interests is given splash notes in the papers here. Then there is an item, a brief one, in the Fokusher Bierbachter, that Germany and Yugoslavia have signed a trade agreement. This will seem to indicate that another Balkan country has been reorientated. Yugoslavia will now do business with Germany, long lines planned for it, and a new Europe that is solely emerging from German conference stones. The wartime action of the Australian government in taking over the mandated islands of New Guinea and Papua in the South Seas is regarded as a flagrant violation of international law by the local anzeiger this morning. This Berlin paper features the story on its front page. It states, as expected, that this action is another proof of the illegal attitude of the British Empire towards international law and its government. Reports from New York that Al Williams, the famous American aviator, has written that Germany has a definite air superiority of three to one over the Great Britain, are seized upon by the German radio stations. The German shortwave news broadcast to England repeatedly state that Major Williams has declared that the German offensive against England will be the most surprising and most swift military action in world's history. And speaking of the German radio, there was a new pro weekly program announced. It will be called, quote, France Says No to Life. According to reports, it will be a continuation of the campaign against politicians of the pre-armistice period of France. This campaign has been going on for some weeks. And in unoccupied France, new Supreme Court will open sessions in Lyon on Thursday. The judges are instructed by the Paytime government to investigate and fix the responsibility of the war and its loss. And among those who will be examined, as well as being placed on trial, will be former ministers, journalists, political party officials, trade unionists, and the like. And from what I have gathered both here and in Paris, will be a highly publicized and slanted job of muckraking. In fact, today, the average man seems to be occupied with but two problems and he is still seeking their solutions. First, he wants to know what caused the swift and crushing military disaster, as well as those who were to blame. And secondly, what are the prospects of permanent employment in a country that has been jarred off its social, political, and economic foundations? Sir Lancelot Oliphant, who was the British ambassador in Brussels when the Blitzkrieg started, is now being held in Germany, technically a prisoner of war. During a recent British air raid over northern Germany, Sir Lancelot was requested by his guards to go down into the air raid shelters. And he is reported to have replied, I'm the British ambassador, and I bloody well will not go down for the British planes overhead. Notwithstanding his attitude, he was taken down the shelter. However, he has continued his protests, so the question of whether the British ambassador could stay above ground during the British air raids, was taken away by Hitler himself. According to this story, Herr Hitler has decided the British ambassador to do what he pleased during an air raid. This is Edwin Hartwig, I return you now to Columbia, New York. This is New York. Here's the Press Association dispatch from Moscow. The controlled press today says the persecution of Finnish workers favoring friendly relations with Russia is continuing. And in Vichy, France, it is reported that France's authoritarian government may soon may move to the site of her absolute monarchy, the magnificent palace of Versailles, where the Bourbon kings ruled from 1627 until 1789. Now the news from our own national capital, reported by John Charles Daly. We take you now to Washington. This is Washington. 
President Roosevelt plans to leave the capital this afternoon to spend about a week at his Hyde Park home. The week of rest, however, will be broken by another inspection trip of the nation's military defenses, his second in as many weeks. Following last Monday's study of defense units in the Chesapeake Bay area, the primary bases of defense for the nation's capital, Mr. Roosevelt reportedly is to look over New York City defenses and upstate New York military units this coming week. Also on defense matters, the president has struck back at charges that our preparedness program is bogging down because of an alleged excess of red tape. Mr. Roosevelt branded as highly misleading reports which had been published in several papers that virtually no contracts for planes, tanks, or other military equipment had been signed, and that, as a result, no military supplies to speak of were being produced. The president delegated Robert Horton, information director of the Defense Advisory Commission, to answer the charges. Horton met reporters in the cabinet room at the White House following the president's conference. Eighty million dollars in aircraft contracts have been cleared, Horton said, and the planes are actually coming off the assembly lines, despite the fact that contracts have not been consummated. The aviation companies are holding the planes for delivery until the contracts are completed. Horton also said that despite the charges of red tape, the American Car and Foundry Company is producing from two and a half to three medium tanks of new design a day on its order for 1,156 of them. This output would be doubled within three months, he maintained, in answer to stories which conveyed the impression that delays in production of armor plate were stalling the tank program. The defense program calls for 25,000 planes, 18,000 for the Army and 7,000 for the Navy by July 1st of 1942. These will be ready by that time, Horton declared, with defense authorities concentrating at first on the production of training planes. While President Roosevelt is wholeheartedly endorsing the principle of selective service, his former Secretary of War, Harry W. Woodring, in a letter to Senator Arthur Vandenberg, anti-conscription leader in the Senate, declares himself as opposed to selective service. Woodring said that the selective draft bill smacks of totalitarianism. He believes that the voluntary system should be given a fair trial first. It is reported in the Capitol this morning that Senator Vandenberg, Senator Wheeler, and other outspoken critics of conscription plan to offer an amendment to the Burke-Wadsworth bill, a provision for one-year voluntary enlistment to take the place of the present amendment calling for the compulsory service of those in the 21 to 31 age group. This plan is supposed to have been fathered by former Secretary of War Woodring. The tax subcommittee of the House Ways and Means Committee have taken a weekend rest recess, but not without having made substantial progress toward the triple goal of an amortization plan to encourage plant expansion for national defense, a new excess profits levy, and the lifting of the limitations of the Vincent Trammell Bill on airplane and warship contracts. This three-point program was submitted to the full Ways and Means Committee of the House by subcommittee chairman Jerry Cooper yesterday, and it is hoped that the subcommittee will have a bill in shape by the middle of next week so that the full committee can start public hearings. The amortization plan tentatively agreed upon by the subcommittee proposes to exempt from taxation over a five-year period all industrial income which is used to pay the cost of emergency industrial expansion. During that five-year period, corporations will be granted a tax exemption each year on income equal to 20% of the cost of expansion. Firms seeking such exemption will have to obtain certificates from the War Department, Navy Department, or the President's Advisory Defense Commission stating that the expansion was required by the defense contracts. Industry is expected to approve the plan. In fact, some aviation firms and armament manufacturers have gone ahead with their defense orders on the understanding that such a plan will be adopted. Congressional leaders have told the president that they hope for final passage of the bill within a month. On another defense front, the presidential discussions with the Defense Council on the housing problems that would be created by the defense program are bearing fruit. The United States Housing Authority announces that within 30 days, 6,300 homes will be built for enlisted personnel and civilian workers in 16 localities throughout the country. We return you now to New York. And with these reports from our nation's capital, Columbia concludes another report of European developments, reported from London this morning by Eric Severide, and from Berlin by Edwin Hartridge, from Washington by John Charles Daly. Larry Elliott speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.